right now. And I'm going to be starting the webinar in five, four, three, two. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. So wonderful to see you all. My name is Emily Vordy. I am an associate director in the Office of Public Engagement here at the White House. My pronouns are she and her, and I am a short of stature wheelchair user. I'm a white woman with blonde hair, and I'm wearing a gray dress. It's fantastic to be with you all here today uh, to talk about some really exciting guidance that was released just one week ago today uh, in collaboration between uh, the Office of Health and uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and Departments of Justice, Education and Labor. Um, the administration put out a, a guidance document on uh, resources available for those experiencing symptoms following long COVID. So we've gathered together today. Uh, I'm, I'm just kicking us off, but our experts are here on hand from all of the, the aforementioned departments to talk to you a little bit about the guidance put out by their specific office and agency. Uh, and we'll have some time at the end for some brief questions uh, that you submitted uh, during registration. So know how grateful I am for you all being here today. With that, I'm going to kick it off to Robin Sue, who is joining us from the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights. Robin Sue. Thank you so much, Emily, and good afternoon to the many stakeholders who are participating. My name is Robin Sue Ferbozzi, and I am the acting director of the HHS Office for Civil Rights, which we refer to as OCR for short. I use the pronouns she and her, and for a visual description, I'm a white woman who has short, light-colored brown hair. I'm wearing a salmon-colored jacket and uh, a salmon and black scarf. And I'm speaking to from my office in Washington, DC. As you heard, a number of federal agencies issued guidance on long COVID last Monday to discuss how it impacts individuals they serve. And I'm going to be focusing on the guidance that the HHS Office for Civil Rights, my office, issued jointly with our colleagues at the Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice. Some of you may have participated in the HHS stakeholder briefing last Wednesday, where we focused on this guidance. But for those of you who were not able to join or would like a refresher about the guidance, that's what I'll be focusing my remarks on. And this guidance talks about how people with long COVID are protected under three of the many federal disabilities rights laws. So the three laws that are covered by the joint HHS DOJ guidance are titles two and three of the Americans with Disabilities Act section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and the non-discrimination provision in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which we refer to as Section 1557. And each of these laws is very similar in the types of protections that they offer to people with disabilities but they differ in their scope of coverage. So Title II applies to state and local governments. Title III of the ADA, places of public accommodation. Section 504 covers federally funded and operated programs and activities. And, the, and so our office within HHS covers programs or activities that are funded or operated by HHS. And section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act applies to health programs or activities. 
And our office actually has sole jurisdiction over this provision in terms of rulemaking, setting policy, and also um, writing, um, and also in terms of enforcement. The HHS DOJ guidance is very short and it's written for consumers so that they understand their rights, but it's also useful to providers. It has a series of five questions and those questions describe long COVID and its symptoms, explains the definition of disability under the three laws I reference, and applying that definition, the guidance explains when long COVID can be a disability that are protected by these laws and when it is not. It also describes the rights of people whose long COVID is covered under these laws. And it provides a list of federal resources for people with symptoms of long COVID. So I'd like to spend just a few minutes explaining what we mean in the guidance when we say that long COVID can be a disability under titles two and three of the ADA Section 504 and Section 1557. Under these laws, there is a two-part definition or test in order to be protected by the laws. And the first is that an individual must have a physical or mental impairment. The second is that impairment must substantially limit one or more major life activities. And as our guidance explains, long COVID by definition is a physical or mental impairment. And that's because long COVID is a physiological condition affecting one or more bodily symptoms or one or more bodily functions, excuse me. For example, some people with long COVID can experience respiratory, heart, circulatory or neurological problems, and other individuals can experience what has been come to known as brain fog or emotional or mental health challenges. The second part of the test, however, is whether this physical or mental impairment substantially limits a major life activity. And this is really the key part of the test because if the physical or mental impairment does not substantially limit a major life activity, then it's not covered by these federal disability rights laws. And so just because someone has long COVID and by definition has a physical or mental impairment, it doesn't necessarily mean that the impairment rises to the level of a disability as, as defined by these federal laws. Our guidance provides examples of situations where someone has long COVID that might be, that might result in the substantial limitation of major life activities. And importantly, it also underscores that this is always an individualized assessment, which must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. So the key takeaway take is that while our guidance say that every individual with, with long COVID is protected by disability rights laws, it is intended to help consumers understand when long COVID may have a disability and the rights that they have under the various federal disability rights laws. So as always, we appreciate your bringing issues to our attention so that we can provide guidance on topics of interest. And this is a topic that actually came out of the stakeholder listening session that the White House held. So we heard your concerns and issued this guidance. 
And also a reminder that you can always file complaints with the HHS Office for Civil Rights or the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice if you feel your, your rights have been violated. And there's information about how to file complaints that we included at the bottom of our guidance. And you can also call either the Department of Justice ADA information line or the HHS Office for Civil Rights Call Center if you have questions. And both of these numbers are also listed on our website. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jasmine Bolton at the Department of Education about the Department of Education's guidance that was issued along with the HHS DOJ guidance. Jasmine? Thank you, Robin Sue. Hello, my name is Jasmine Bolton, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am senior counsel in the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Education. First, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on the work of OCR at the Department of Education. And then I'll get into a, a brief summary of some of the, a piece of the, a piece of the resource that we uh, released last week. After that, I will pass things over to my colleague in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services to discuss the other component of uh, the document that the Department of Education released last week. In the Office for Civil Rights, our mission is to ensure equal access to education and to promote educational excellence through vigorous enforcement of civil rights in our nation's schools. An essential priority at the Department of Education and within OCR specifically is to meet President Biden's challenge to embed fairness and equity into our school systems and remove barriers to student success, both for today and for the future. Access and equity in education are at the heart of our responsibilities to students. And I will briefly pause here. I'm so sorry, I forgot to give a visual description. Again, my name is Jasmine, I'm wearing a white blouse. Um, I'm a black woman, I have black braids that are in a low bun. Okay, back to the regularly scheduled programming. <clears throat> Access and equity in education are at the heart of our responsibilities to students. This is especially important as our schools reopen in the midst of an ongoing pandemic. We have an opportunity to take on longstanding disparities as we also are doing the work of addressing the disparities and uneven harms to communities caused by the pandemic. As we build back better, it is especially important that everyone, students, families, teachers, staff, and the broader national community knows that this country's education civil rights laws are a promise from Congress dating back for decades now that students can attend school and school activities free from discrimination based on race, color, national origin, sex, age, and disability. In the Office for Civil Rights, we are busy at work on these efforts ranging across the statutes that we enforce, moving forward with thoughtful urgency to ensure our nation is a place where all students attend and participate in school free from discrimination as schools begin to reopen and beyond. As many of you know, last week marked the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, a law which prohibits discrimination against persons with disabilities. To, to commemorate this landmark legislation, several of the federal agencies that are on this call released guidance documents about disabilities resulting from the COVID-19 virus. As Robin Sue just mentioned, um, on July 26th, we at the, <clears throat> The Department of Education um, followed the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services in issuing um, guidance uh, explaining how those with long COVID may have a disability, may have a disability under the laws that uh, we enforce. Uh, this guidance was issued jointly um, with the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights and the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. Um, our resource focuses on two federal laws, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, um, as Robinson discussed, and Parts B and C of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. I will be discussing Section 504, and my colleague Dan from OSERS will be discussing IDEA. 
Section 504 prohibits dis disability discrimination and ensures that students with disabilities have equal access to educational opportunities. In the education context, this law applies to schools that receive federal financial assistance from the Department of Education, and it is enforced by the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Education. Our resource document states that the health effects of, COVID of the COVID-19 pandemic are likely to be lasting and wide ranging. And this includes a lasting impact on students. The CDC has reported that long COVID can involve continuing recurrent or new symptoms and clinical findings that persist for weeks, months or longer and can affect even those who have had asymptomatic COVID-19 infection or who experienced mild initial illness, including younger individuals. Other conditions such as mental health conditions may also arise, arise from contracting COVID-19 or the associated facets of the pandemic. As Robin Sue so wonderfully described, uh, under Section 504, a person has a disability if they have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, if that person has a record of such an impairment or if, that, if they are regarded as having such an impairment. Major life activities include, for example, breathing and concentrating, as well as major bodily functions, such as, such as the functions of the immune system. A student does not need to be substantially limited in their learning to be eligible for protection and services under Section 504. Some children and students who were already identified as having a disability under IDEA and or Section 504 and who have contracted COVID-19 may experience new or worsened symptoms related to their pre-existing disability, to COVID-19 or to both. If these systems persist in the form of long COVID, these children or students may need new or different related aids and services, specialized instruction or reasonable modifications. Other children or students may be found eligible for services under IDEA and or Section 504 for the first time if long COVID substantially limits one or more of the student's major life activities. Early childhood, elementary, and secondary students must be evaluated on an individual basis and decisions concerning a student's eligibility for services should not be made based on a diagnosis alone. For students who have already received services under Section 504, schools must provide reevaluations periodically and prior to significant change in placement. After the evaluation is complete, a group of people knowledgeable about the student and the student's evaluation data and placement options review the evaluation results and determine the student's placement based on whether the student has a disability and what, if any, supports may be needed. For example, a student who has had COVID-19 and who continues to have difficulty concentrating may require an evaluation to determine if the student has a disability and needs special education or related services, such as additional time to finish classwork or test. Colleges and universities also have obligations under Section 504 and must provide students with disabilities an opportunity to participate that is equal to that of students without disabilities, including students whose long COVID substantially limits a major life activity. For example, a post-secondary student whose long COVID makes walking and breathing difficult might approach their disability services office to request a reasonable modification to register for classes early so they can design a schedule that minimizes walking distances between classes. Now, I will turn things over to my colleague, Dan in OSERS to discuss the other component of the Department of Education's resource. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Daniel Schreier in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services at the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, my preferred pronouns are he, him, uh, his. Um, in sort of context, I am a, a Caucasian male uh, wearing a blue and white button-down shirt, and I am uh, sitting in my basement in Columbia, Maryland, so it's great to be with everyone today. Um, so, 
as uh, Jasmine pointed out, it was really wonderful to collaborate with the Office of Civil Rights and our other federal partners in developing our guidance. Um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is administered by the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, um, consists of two parts. The IDA Part B is primarily for children age three through 21 in most states. Some states have a slightly different age range, but um, that's the IDA Part B program. And IDA Part C, is for infants and toddlers birth through age three. Um, and within our guidance, we were able to provide information on long COVID for both of the programs. Um, so generally speaking, um, sorry, I lost my talking points. Um, the um, IDA has a, has a partnership where we partner with states, local school districts, um, also with state uh, health departments for in local intervention providers uh, in implementing the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, so this typically will result in uh, federal government issuing guidance, um, which will then be implemented by states and then further subsequently adopted and implemented by school districts uh, across the country. Um, and in support of that, we provide grants for both IDA Part B and IDA Part C uh, to states and they will typically subgrant those grants to school districts or early intervention providers. Um, so this definitely is a partnership, the way we implement IDA. Um, and so this will definitely have far reaching effects across the country. Um, so when we talk about children with disabilities and we use a slightly different term than OCR, um, that's just because of the way the statutes are written. Uh, we, we talk about children, um, of students, but um, similarly, we have similar standards where we expect um, both under Part C and Part B of the Act that, that uh, three activities will need to occur for, for children uh, who are suffering for long COVID and potentially need services under IDA. Uh, there'll need to be an activity called Child Find, where uh, there's an affirmative obligation to identify uh, infants, toddlers, and children who, who are suspected of having a disability. Uh, there then needs to be an evaluation conducted uh, by the school districts or early intervention providers to examine whether the child is eligible for services under IDA. Um, and if the child uh, is determined eligible by a team of both the parents and uh, educators or early intervention providers, uh, the uh, development of a individualized family service plan for infants and toddlers or an individualized education program for children under IDA Part B. Um, so in our, our joint resource document, we, we publicly stated that um, children and youth may be eligible for special education related services if they're experiencing limited strength, vitality, alertness, or chronic or acute health problems that adversely affect the child's educational performance and require special education as a result of long COVID. Um, and in looking at CDC documents, it's we would anticipate that that children who would require special education would probably fall under the category of an other health impairment. But it is not limited to another health impairment under IDA. There are other disability categories that may also um, warrant uh, services under IDA. Um, for infants and toddlers, there may be eligibility for early intervention services if after an evaluation of, of the infant or toddler, the, the team determines that the child has a developmental delay based on the stage criteria uh, as a result of long COVID and therefore needs services. Um, the guidance document does provide some examples. Uh, they're not exhaustive of what special education or early intervention services could look like for, for a child uh, who has long COVID um, and recognizing that it is evolving um, and that uh, we, we know that additional sort of, um, of challenges of, of having long COVID have, have arisen even in the past month. Um, so we, we know this will be a, an emerging field and expect that some children will actually receive special education services because of long COVID. Um, we do, because IDA is, uh, really involves parents and involves parental support, the, uh, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, um, does fund uh, parent training and information centers across the country. Uh, we have over 100 parent and training centers um, who can provide resources to, to families regarding more information regarding the IDA. Um, and, and they can actually get resources and either get support 
as their child goes through the process or can get referred out for additional support and resources. Um, and that website is www.parentcenterhub.org. Um, so that's my section of the presentation. I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Alison Barkoff at uh, ACL. Thanks, Dan. Um, my name is Allison Barkoff, and I'm the Acting Administrator and Assistant Secretary uh, for Aging at the Administration for Community Living, or ACL. Um, I'll start with the visual description. I'm a white woman with curly brown shoulder length hair, and I'm wearing a white blouse and have a background that has both the HHS and ACL logos. And my pronouns are she and her. ACL is the federal agency in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and our mission is to support all people, regardless of disability or age, to live and fully participate in their communities. ACL has a range of disability and aging programs and funds disability and aging networks that are in every state and community. We have more than 20,000 community-based organizations that are part of our networks. We also serve as the advisor to the secretary of HHS and work across the federal government on policies related to people with disabilities and older adults. And of course, a crucial piece to doing that role well is hearing from the disability and aging communities. And from the time I joined the Biden-Harris administration in late January, COVID-19 has been a top priority for ACL. We've been working on issues like vaccine access, ensuring that people have the supports they need to remain safe in the community, and we've worked to help people transition out of high-risk institutional and congregate settings. Much of this work has been in collaboration with HHS's Office for Civil Rights and other federal partners. And we've worked closely with the White House, HHS's COVID team, and the COVID Equity Task Force. As Robin Sue mentioned, we have been hearing from stakeholders about the need for federal agencies to address questions about long COVID for uh, several months. And in a number of stakeholder meetings, we heard questions about how people with long COVID were protected under disability laws and what resources are available to people experiencing long COVID. Last Monday on the 31st anniversary of the ADA, um, ACL released a document as part of the administration's long COVID package called How ACL's Disability and Aging Networks Can Help People with Long COVID. And this document is a guide to resources and supports that may be available in your community. It's targeted to people who may now need assistance due to the impact of long COVID or other disabilities, whether it's assistance to live in your own home or to participate in community activities or in the workplace or school. For people who don't know where to start, we have a national hotline that can provide information about services and supports called the Disability Information and Access Hotline or DIAL. And the number is 1-888-677-1199. Or you can learn more online at acl.gov backslash dial, D-I-A-L. Our document also describes ACL's networks that provide direct services, like our Centers for Independent Living, Aging and Disability Resource Centers, and Area Agencies on Aging. And we also highlight ACL specialized programs, including the protection and advocacy systems that can provide legal advocacy to people experiencing long COVID, the state assistive technology programs that can help people with long COVID in meeting their assistive technology needs, as well as the state long-term care ombudsman program that advocate for people in long-term care facilities and our tribal and Native American elder programs. Finally, our guidance contains a journey map to visually help people know who to contact based on the support that they need. 
All of this information and much more related to COVID-19 is available on ACL's website at acl.gov backslash COVID-19. That's acl.gov backslash COVID, C-O-V-I-D hyphen 19. And now I'm going to turn it over to Renee Tajuddin at the Department of Labor. Thank you, Allison, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Renee Tajanin, and I'm with the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the US Department of Labor. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm a white woman with blonde hair wearing a brown dress and a white sweater. And I'm speaking to you from my home in Fairfax, Virginia. So the Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP, is a non-regulatory federal agency that promotes policies and coordinates with employers in all levels of government to increase workplace success for people with disabilities. ODEP's mission is to help uh, develop and influence policies and practices that increase the number and quality of employment opportunities for people with disabilities. So I just wanna say that grounded in the desired outcomes of full participation, equal opportunity, independent living and economic self-sufficiency, the administration has produced critical resources for Americans with disabilities. The Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy worked with the Departments of Health and Human Services and Education and the Social Security Administration on a fact sheet available on the ODEP website under Integ Integrated Employment that highlights new funding opportunities and flexibilities for increasing access to competitive integrated employment for youth and adults with disabilities. So these new funding opportunities and flexibilities provide significant opportunities for youth and adults with disabilities in support of their desire to live and work in the most integrated settings in their communities. These investments will help people with disabilities become income producers, savers, and asset builders, contributing to the economy and helping our nation build back better. So the increased funding and flexibilities are provided under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan Act, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, and the Further Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020 as well as through the work of multiple federal agencies that you've heard from today. Another new resource also available through the ODEP website is a financial toolkit that guides people with disabilities as they strive to obtain or maintain employment and achieve financial stability in the wake of new levels of financial stress due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Three agencies from the Department of Labor, including ODEP, the Employee Benefits Security Administration, and the Employment and Training Administration produced this toolkit. It's organized around five phases of the work life cycle, preparing for a job, starting a job, maintaining a job, changing or losing a job, and retiring from a job. The toolkit features tools and resources addressing common financial concerns during each of these life cycles. ODEP also launched a new web page that includes resources on long COVID organized into groups for workers, youth and young adults, employers, and policymakers. The resources include information on requesting and providing workplace accommodations for individuals with long COVID, employee benefits and services, youth services, and employer resources, and more. In addition to the website, the Department of Labor released a blog discussing the impact of long COVID on workers with disabilities and outlines available help from the Job Accommodation Network, or JAN. So JAN is a free service funded by ODEP that provides expert technical assistance and confidential guidance about reasonable workplace accommodations. A reasonable accommodation is a modification or adjustment to a job, the work environment, or the way things are usually done during the hiring process that enable an employee or job seeker to perform to the same extent as a person without a disability. JAN can provide one-on-one -on -one service to job seekers, employees, their employers, 
service providers, and family and friends of people with disabilities. So really anyone can reach Jan at askjan.org. Also, the US Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, produced a radio public service announcement that explains that people dealing with long COVID may be entitled to temporary or long-term accommodations that can help them stay on the job or return to work when ready and points them to Jan for more information. Lastly, we know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the country experienced a significant increase in anxiety, depression, and other behavioral health conditions. To help address this, ODEP announced a webinar and released an issue brief on funding for mental health service delivery for youth. On August 24th, the ODEP funded Center for Advancing Policy on Employment for Youth, or CAPE Youth, will host the webinar entitled Funding Mental Health Service Delivery for Youth with First Episode of Psychosis, using resources available through the Workforce Development System and American Rescue Plan. This webinar and issue brief will address effective practices and funds that state and local policymakers can use for coordinated specialty care service delivery, including supported education and employment for the estimated 115,000 individuals who experience a first episode of psychosis annually. Thank you. And I'd like to turn it back over to Emily. Thank you so much, Renee. Uh, we have about five or six minutes left. So I wanna pose to our panelists um, some, some of the questions that were submitted when you all registered. So the first one, actually, Renee, I'm gonna pull you back up if I can. One of our, one of our participants asked, uh, they're an employer and they're wondering what type of job accommodation requests should employers prepare for when supporting workers with long COVID? Sure, um, yeah, so I had talked about uh, the ODEP funded free resource known as the Job Accommodation Network that provides free expert technical assistance and confidential guidance about workplace accommodations. Well, I checked with them and Jan tells us that they are seeing the, um, most of the questions around long COVID and co accommodations being related to fatigue and shortness of breath. So in the accommodations that might work with that are um, rest breaks, flexible schedules and telework. And telework comes into play because with the shortness of breath, uh, mask wearing can be a problem. And of course, telework can be an accommodation for other uh, symptoms as well. So um, other requests uh, might address the symptoms that were mentioned before, such as brain fog or insomnia and body aches. And some suggestions for these for accommodations are quiet workspaces, uh, use of memory aids like flowcharts and checklists, and um, possibly reducing physical demands of the job. So any more specific ideas or questions, again, people can reach Jan at askjan.org. Awesome, thank you, Renee. Uh, another one of our participants asked, many of us facing long haul COVID symptoms got sick before testing was widely available. Without a positive test, what evidence will be required to prove that we're eligible for support? Robin Sue, would you want to speak to this by chance uh, from coming from your, your OCR HHS perspective? Sure. Thank you, Emily. I'm, I'm happy to jump in with this very important question because in formulating our guidance, we worked very closely with CDC uh, here in, in, in here in HHS. And so I think that there is a, a fundamental misunderstanding about the Americans with Disabilities Act 504 and 1557. A diagnosis is not needed in order to qualify for the protections offered by these laws. What is important, as I said during my remarks, is that there's a physical or mental impairment. And in consultation with the CDC, in our guidance, we, reign, we um, list about a dozen different um, symptoms that people with long COVID are experiencing. And they range from fatigue and tiredness to 
um, loss of breath or difficulty breathing, chest palpitations or heart um, chest pain, and shortness of breath and loss of taste and smell, as well as I, I had mentioned brain fog, which is difficulty thinking or concentrating, and then also uh, depression or anxiety. Now, we, we also do make it clear in our guidance, as does CDC on its website, that long COVID is a phenomena that is evolving in terms of the scientific understanding. And CDC and NIH, along with just worldwide scientists, are working to study this phenomenon. And as we find out more information, we'll have a better understanding of long COVID. But CDC has said that by definition, long COVID is a physical or mental impairment. And then remember that the, the key part of the test is whether that impairment um, impacts, significantly impacts an activity of daily living. Fantastic. Well, we've just got one more minute here. So I'm gonna close this out with one final question. Uh, and that is for the folks uh, from the Department of Education on the call. And one of our participants asks, what guidance does the administration have for children with long COVID that are preparing to return to school? Dan, I'm not sure if you wanted to take uh, a first crack at this one. Okay, um, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, my video is uh, is not on, but um, definitely I'll, I'll start and Jasmine, you can chime in as well. Um, but it's it's worth uh, communicating and, and talking uh, with school with school officials um, to, to talk about your child's needs. Um, you know, as, as virtually all public schools, whether they're institutions of higher education, uh, K to 12 schools, early interventions receive federal funds. Um, many are eligible for protections under Section 504 um, or potentially eligible for special education or uh, early intervention services. But to have those frank discussions um, and be able to share uh, information and concerns you have about your child with educators uh, will go a long way in, in being able to, to talk about the next steps in the process um, as, as there definitely are steps that will need to occur. Uh, before your child can or student can receive services under either Section 504 or IDA. So, so learning about those processes and those steps and um, being able to, to talk with educators uh, to, to learn more about the process so that you can get your child the services uh, that he or she may need. And if I may uh, add very quickly, this is Jasmine Bolton again at from the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Education. Um, completely agree with um, everything that Dan just said. Um, however, if you uh, believe that you or your, uh, a student that you know, right, has been discriminated against, um, you may also file a complaint with OCR at the Department of Education. I believe our Robin Sue discussed the process um, in, in when, she, when she was talking at the beginning of the hour. Um, for more information on um, how to file a complaint, you may visit the department's website. Um, specifically, you, you can file a complaint at https dot, dot slash slash www.ed.gov back, backslash about backslash offices backslash list backslash OCR backslash complaint intro, that's one word, dot HTML. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Dan and Jasmine and all of our panelists. Thank you all for being here today as well. In follow-up to this meeting, we'll be sending around 
uh, the, the resources that have been discussed on this, this call. For those of you who haven't had the chance to see them yet, we would encourage you to dig in, uh, to share with your networks, to make sure that, that uh, all the folks that need to, to see these supports, to see this guidance are doing so. So thank you again, uh, and we look forward to seeing you soon.